joins us via the University of Auckland. But he has taught and thought and published and supervised many PhD students around the world, taught in France, South Africa, Philippines, New Zealand, Indonesia. Look, I'm not one of those men who feels the need to compete, but regularly um, I'm called to um, MC conferences as far away as Adelaide. So um, <laughs> it's nice to meet a peer, JC. Also, one of the things I find fascinating about your work is that you work with some very um, rarely thought of groups and very stigmatised groups, including prisoners, and taking into account prisoners in disaster and emergency, which is, again, pardon my ignorance, something I had not considered until doing a little bit of research on you. And I know you're going to be quite a provocative presenter here today. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, make him very welcome from the University of Auckland, JC Gaya. I usually apologize for being French and for having an awful accent. But I guess in Australia I have to apologize for living in Auckland as well in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and for assuming to apply for a Kiwi passport. Uh, but in fairness, I spent most of the past 20 years in the Philippines, so my accent is a bit of everything. But it's not to worry if I start to say uh, the beast the city either. That's going to be worrying. Um, anyway, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. But it's my first time in Melbourne. Uh, a privilege to be here, well, especially in this uh, famous and prestigious venue. Uh, I'm French, but I love cricket, and I'm weird. Um, so, I mean, it speaks to me somehow. Um, yes, so, um, we're going to talk about uh, inclusiveness and uh, how to foster inclusiveness in uh, disaster risk reduction, the DRR. And, um, I'm going to take you on a uh, musical journey, so I'm going to use uh, music all throughout to sort of illustrate what I'm going to, to say about inclusiveness. Uh, and, sorry, wait, and I'm going to start um, with a uh, karaoke session. It's the <laughs> Filipino side of me. I'm not sure if you oh, like karaoke. <laughs> yes. I told you I'm weird. Um, okay, so. Um, you know this song, Time for Miracles, by Adam Lambert. Probably good for you if you don't know the song. It's possibly not the best song in the world. Uh, so I'm going to show you first the uh, karaoke version of it. So you focus on the lyrics, and then I'm going to show you the music video, the actual music video, and we're going to reflect upon both and how they diverge. Okay, so um, now you start thinking, why is this weird French guy showing us this thing? Uh, my students would say that it's a very cheesy love song that doesn't relate at all to disasters, right? Now, um, how do I move to the next one? Okay, now I'm going to show you the actual music video. And this song was actually the soundtrack for the film, the movie 2012, which is one of these... Uh, Hollywood disaster movies. So now look at the actual music video with the footages of the movie behind the lyrics. And we'll talk about this afterwards. This is exactly what we call uh, the dominant paradigm or the hazard paradigm or what I call the paradigm of the extreme in disaster studies and disaster selection. You have a very, uh, again, play uh, love story that relates to everyday life which doesn't connect to disasters. And then you have these footage of extreme events uh, with people behaving inappropriately, having there's anti-social behaviors, you have people fighting, uh, you have people panicking, and you have all these things that never happen in real life uh, with these extreme events in the background. So you have this disconnect, this divide created between everyday life through the lyrics and these extreme events and inappropriate behaviors in the footages. And this is how we often look at disasters, looking at these events as extreme, extraordinary things that are linked to hazards that are unpredictable, unbelievable, always unsomething, as uh, the great Ken Hewitt used to say. And here, if we compare the lyrics, the everyday nature of the lyrics with the extraordinary nature of the footages, we feel that divide. And we look at disasters outside of the everyday social fabric. 
and outside of everyday life. And if you look at the footages here, there's no real signs of diversity. There's some sort of ethnic diversity in the footages, but there's no homeless people, there's no older people, there's no people with disabilities, there's no prisoners, etc. Right? So in this dominant view of disasters, we don't have any diversity, we don't have any minorities. We look at these events outside of the regular social fabric. And we think of these events as things that require extraordinary attention. And those minority groups fall between the cuts. And we know this is all um, oops, and true now, right? We know that people don't panic in time of disasters. We know that people don't loot in time of disasters. They don't become criminals out of the blue. We know it's not true, right? Uh, now we've moved on, as Maureen said yesterday, towards looking at disasters within the regular social fabric within the context of everyday life. And this is where inclusiveness comes in the picture. But what does it mean actually to foster inclusiveness? So what I want to do now is to encourage your participation in, in the talk. I would usually use markers and, and small pieces of paper because the room is too big, so we're going to have a sort of a more techy version of it. Uh, I guess you all have a connected device? Yes? Could you all go to this uh, submative.com page onto your phone or computer? Yes? Then when you're there, please uh, log in as a student. Sorry, sorry to take you back to your uh, life as a student. Log in as a student and use the room name Gaia1854. And it's Gaia, it's not the surname of the former Australian. Prime Minister. Oops. And you'll be able to access the site for a small monthly fee. Yes. And so you're looking at a student. And it's Gaia 1854. And then you answer the question, the first question, only the first question for now, which is how to define, how to capture inclusiveness in one word. I just want one word. If I say inclusiveness, what does come to your mind? Okay, so we have a few people on. We have the word failure, we have the word respect. We had, um, wait, 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 wait. We had everyone, we had everybody, openness, everyone, caring, justice, all. Um, caring, kindness, justice, all of you, everyone, acceptance, belonging, uh, respect, respect, everyone, global, everything, everyone, embrace, holistic, consider, everyone, empowerment, community, community, all. We won't go through all the words. Thank you for sharing these already. Um, there's one word that doesn't... Uh, can we shift back the, uh, to the slides? There's one word that hasn't come up yet, uh, which is probably the most important to me, but it's not a new, unusual not to see it here. Could we swap back to the, uh, to the slides, please? To the PowerPoint? So there's one word that doesn't come up here, which is the word power. And fostering inclusiveness is all about addressing power relations. Understanding disasters is all about power relations, right? Uh, it's understanding why some people have access to resources available to some and others don't have access to the same resources. Now, um, it's about understanding relationships between people. And I want to illustrate that with um, one more song, one music video by the punk band, the straight age punk band from Chicago, Rise Against. It's a song about Katrina, and it's a song about um, um, the black communities in New Orleans and how they've been affected and what they've been doing in facing Katrina. So I'm going to show you the music video, not to the end, but for some... Okay, so, uh, the song shows us, or the video shows us two things. First, that uh, these minority groups in disasters are made vulnerable by 
forces the drivers beyond their own grasp. And this is the final bit here in the video where they are calling for help. The helicopter is, is flying around but doesn't give notice to them. So they've been forced into this situation by exogenous forces. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. But at the same time, these people have what we call capacities. So they have resources. They are not helpless in facing this situation. The water is rising, but still they find a way through the roof and seek shelter on top of the house. Right? So they are not helpless despite of being marginalized and being made vulnerable by how power and resources are shared within society. And this is what we observe for most minority groups all over the world in time of disasters. And yesterday there was a panel about uh, LGBTIQ plus and gender minorities. I'm using one more example here about the warrior in Indonesia. These guys, in time of disasters, like this one, it was the eruption of Mount Merah in 2010 in Java, uh, couldn't seek shelter in the official uh, evacuation centers because they would be discriminated and be harassed by um, other members of society. So they would usually seek shelter with friends and, and hide and can't get access to see to resources, village goods, and this kind of things that others have access to because they are marginalized in everyday life. But at the same time, they were providing resources to everyone in the evacuation centers. They started to organize themselves and started to uh, distribute credit goods into evacuation centers where none of them were uh, hosted at the time. And they were initially uh, denied access because these warriors don't have access to the evacuation center. And they started to be accepted in the evacuation centers when they started to provide uh, free haircut and free manicure services to the evacuees. And that proved super useful because none of these uh, aid organizations providing support in the evacuation centers really care for these everyday well-being things that they care for. And that's how they became accepted because they were the only one providing those types of services. And the important thing here is that these capacities, these skills they were offering to the evacuees were nothing coming out of the blue. They were just the extension of what they do in everyday life because many of these guys work in beauty parlors and um, hairdresser shops. And this is one of the, the important points I want to make here is that when we deal with disasters and when we deal with, with these minorities as much as with everyone else basically, we are dealing with these ex exogenous forces, drivers of vulnerability that lie beyond the hands of those who are vulnerable. You are made vulnerable by how power and resources are shared within society. So they are largely exogenous. But these capacities, like for these black family in New Orleans who were just going through the roof, or like the warrior in Indonesia, the capacities are largely endogenous. They have control of them. This is their local knowledge, skills, resources, extended from everyday life. And this is important because if you deal with disaster risk reduction, it's going to be so much easier to enhance capacities than to address the root causes of vulnerability. I'm always concerned, if not pissed off, by my NGO friends when we start a training called Marx, and who my friends who tell the, the people, okay, at the end of the week you're going to be I mean, addressing vulnerability is a task for those with power. It's about granting access to resources. It's about sharing power in the first place. It's very, very difficult to address the root causes of vulnerability. It's so much easier to enhance capacity because you have control of them. You have grasp on them. And this is going to be crucial. But if we want to foster inclusiveness, it's about both. It's about addressing the root causes of vulnerability and enhancing capacities. So it's going to be a multi scalar kind of process. Now, this is more or less well acknowledged in policy and practice. Most practitioners will recognize those kind of things. Uh, it's somehow in the Sendai framework, so we've talked a bit about it yesterday, the main uh, document guiding uh, policies at the international level now, signed by 187 countries in 2015 in Sendai, Japan. So inclusiveness is often mentioned in the document. And the main goal of the framework is actually mentioning inclusive. What we do for DRR has to be inclusive. So we've gone a long way since uh, uh, the 1970s and, and, 
and there's movies like um, 2012. Now, if we look more in details into the document, we uh, have this section 5. Uh, I used to call it the infamous section 5, but I think I've changed my mind somehow. There's some, some good things in it. Uh, but there are six groups mentioned, named them. And Maureen talked about women yesterday. We have women, we have the children, we have people with disabilities, we have older people, we have the migrants, and we have the indigenous people. Great, they are there. But there's nowhere in the document any framework to actually pull them together. There's nothing about intersectionality. If they are there, they are there because of the fantastic individual lobbying of stakeholder groups, so the women group, Maureen mentioned yesterday for the women, uh, IOM, the International Organization of Migration, managed to get the migrants in the document, I was very surprised, but they love it very, very hard, how to do that. But this list is far from being exhausted, right? There are people missing there. I'm going to return to that afterwards. So it's a separate lobbying of different organizations, getting to have these groups in the document. And it actually reflects the practice of inclusiveness in disaster risk reduction at the moment. Still, it's changing for the better, but it's still very much emphasized in these two reports. I'm using UNISDR reports. It could be any other NGO reports or other organizations' reports. But it's about women and it's about children. If you look at these two covers, to me it shows exclusiveness more than inclusiveness. It's only women or only children. And there's an issue here. Because if you work only with children, only with women, it's a good start. You may be emphasizing capacities and strengthening capacities, but in no way you address the power relations between these groups and those with power in society. And I'm using here a quote from a student of mine who's soon to submit her master's thesis on, on Tonga, gender in Tonga. But these guys, whether they're children, gender minorities, or, um, or women, or whoever, people are stupid, they know what their vulnerabilities and capacities are in most instances. The point is to have others, those with power, to recognize what the vulnerabilities of these guys are and what their capacities are. So if you work in the side or only with them, it's a good start, but nowhere you address this power relations. So you need to create a dialogue between insiders and outsiders. And that's a tricky bit. At the moment, we're not that doing that very well, except maybe for those working with children. These NGOs, like say the Children Plan, World Vision, are doing a good job because they think of children within their families, so they are engaging adults as well. But otherwise, it's not very often the case. And I'm using one example here. I had the chance somehow to be in the draft co drafting committee for the Incheon Declaration on DRR, which was a declaration made at the end of the uh, Asian Ministerial Conference for DRR in 2010 in Korea. And uh, it was one of these late night uh, drafting committee meetings. And uh, out of the blue, there was one woman from UNICEF at the time. It wasn't yet UN woman. Uh, out of the blue, she started to advocate, oh, we need women to be there, in the document. As Maureen said yesterday, it's good to have these groups named. But, I mean, I was sitting with a guy from Plan Bangladesh and a guy from the IFRC, Red Cross in, in, in Bangkok, and we realized, okay, but if we have the women in the document, we need other groups as well, otherwise we further marginalize them. So we had to advocate, and we fought very hard to get just the people with disabilities, I think, uh, children and uh, older people to be there. But we knew we were missing people, and that's, the, that's one of the major issues. By listing people, and I agree it's important, but by starting to list people, we are sure to miss out on some others. For example, this document. It's a fantastic document, it's exhaustive, and I'm not pushing back against it, right? But possibly the most vulnerable of all groups, and it's a large group, is not there. The most marginalized probably is not there. Prisoners. They are dying in hundreds in disasters. No one gives them any attention. So it's, it's tricky. We're always missing out on some, on some groups. 
So starting to list them is good in the sense we need them to be recognized, but at the same time we further marginalize those who are not there. And it's tricky because I've, I spend a lot of time in prisons in the Philippines at the moment, and I've started to work, okay, older gender minority members in prisons. That's a sort of never-ending process of starting to list people and, and intersectionality. It's tricky, it's very difficult. So whether we should start naming or not, I understand we should do that for the sake of getting things done, but at the same time, there are many sh shortcomings with doing that. Um, so we are facing challenges and opportunities, and I want to expand a bit more on this. I'm going to skip that one because time is flying, I guess. Um, I'm just going to show you another um, music video. So the, the thing here with this um, sort of participatory music video making is that the tool, the video tool, kind of engage these kids with the broader society. Somehow if these kids are able to make their own music video, uh, they are not helpless. I mean, there's something they can do with it. And it makes them somehow tangible, credible, trusted on, uh, on the DRR scene. And making, building that trust is probably the most important challenge. And I was kind of hoping to get that word out of the, the, the other Socrative poll. Uh, and it's very difficult to build trust to bridge the gap between the insiders and outsiders. And again, we're doing a lot of work with prisons in the Philippines at the moment. We started with research, try to understand how it works in prisons. And it's a very complicated micro society in the Philippines. But now we're working towards involving prisoners into the DR planning within the prisons, having DR officers within each and every cell. And it's bringing a dialogue between the prisoners and the, and the wardens and the guards. And it's difficult, although in the Philippines it's not as difficult as you may think. But um, it's about creating that dialogue. And it's difficult between insiders and outsiders. And you may have seen this, this diagram before. Uh, but the whole point is we need this dialogue to happen if we want to have an integrated process where we have different forms of knowledge coming together and we have different forms of actions coming together. The actions from the bottom up to enhance capacities and the actions from the top down code marks or from the outside to the inside to address the root causes of vulnerability. It's a task for those with power, again. So we need that dialogue to happen and it's difficult. I'm using this picture again to emphasize the importance of the tools because we need to open up the platform, we need to open up the space for the dialogue to occur. So we do a lot of participatory mapping with NGOs and, and, and local governments. This one was in the Philippines uh, eight years ago and we were working with this Pakla uh, community, so the gender minority in the Philippines. And uh, what I want to emphasize on this picture is that this guy here, so we were doing that with the other uh, members of the, the village um, to create the dialogue. And this guy here, who was a village councillor at the time, started to laugh at first why we wanted outsiders to actually uh, create a dialogue and involve the Bakla in, uh, in these DR activities. And ultimately it worked through the process and it somehow we, get, we got somewhere. But the most important thing is that one year afterwards, that guy had become uh, the village chief. And at that time, we organized um, a meeting with all the village chiefs in the town to try to discuss how we could uh, reproduce this activity or replicate this activity elsewhere in the town. And so he started to talk about what they had done uh, in their own village. And he mentioned, you know, even the Bakla participated and they contributed things. And we were, wow, that's a big step forward compared to where we were a year ago, where he was laughing about it. And it was good because these guys who are marginalized, it's a whole kind of rural setting, uh, discriminated in the evacuation center, but at the same time do a lot contributing to DRR by collecting relief goods and, and distributing them on their own without any integration within the formal DRR planning process. Uh, so it was a good recognition for them. So it was about building again that trust and that dialogue between the insiders and the outsiders. But in that particular case, we initiated that as outsiders, people coming from Manila in that particular case. Um, and that's somehow an issue. And that leads me to my final point, my conclusion, which is um, whether there may be an elephant in the room here. A question we haven't asked, we haven't heard about it yet. 
which is whether it's actually culturally appropriate to foster inclusiveness. And sorry to be blunt here, but we are still very white in this world, all middle aged, uh, all Westerners, or most of us. Uh, so we are thinking mostly from a Western perspective. So is it actually culturally appropriate all the time to foster the participation of the kids, the women, the older people in the RR? I know Maureen said it's yes, it's fair yesterday, but yeah, it's fair, but sometimes, I mean, it can be uh, an issue. Who were we in Nepal a few years ago when we wanted to contribute or to make these kids and these women or this guy who was from a Dalit and Dutchable caste participate in this participatory mapping and planning activity? Who were we as outsiders? These kids. It's in the classroom. They are all classroom at the school. At the start of the training, they were kicked out. And by kicked out, I mean kicked out by the uh, adults. One week before we started this activity, there was a woman who was stoned in public in the same village because she looked at a man who wasn't her husband. So if we want to foster the participation, and, and we did somehow here, we created that dialogue. But we had to challenge culture. At the same time, the Sendai framework tells us, okay, you have to respect culture, you have to uh, look at indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge. There's a tension here. There's a tension between kind of our moral obligation and the cultural values. It's the classic humanitarian dilemma, right? All humanitarian workers have felt that feeling. If you're working in a patriarchal society and in a famine context, if you want to uh, fit the most marginalized, those who may be most in need, maybe the women and the kids, you may have to bypass the uh, traditional men leaders. If you want to respect the culture, then you may end up further marginalizing or starving those in need. It's tricky. I don't have the answer. Don't ask me the answer. I don't know. To me, it's about creating the data. It's about, th about making those, I mean, somehow, I'm providing an answer actually. Um, it's about getting this with power to recognize the needs of the others. Uh, but we actually don't have to go that far, I guess. Uh, we are doing some work at the moment in a small island in uh, East Arnhem, called, um, or used to be called um, Milingimbi. At the moment, it's Yowi. Um, but in that particular place, we were doing some work on water, water resources, water management that could be seen from a DR perspective as well and uh, with the Yolu um, people there. And in that particular island, uh, if the women fly over the island, they have to cover their eyes because only the TOs can have access or look at some particular places, like some villabongs and some uh, very sacred places. And we can't challenge that. It would be culturally inappropriate. So how do we deal with that? I mean, it's a question we need to ask. It's, it's important. It's tricky. I don't have the, I mean, there's no silver bullet answer to that. Uh, but I don't want to finish on a very kind of pessimistic or, or provocative <laughs> note. I've got one more song, and it's a soft one to cool down this time after the punk, after the reggae. Uh, this is Johnny Cash, uh, and this is Five Feet High and Rising, which is about people's capacities dealing with rising water during the Mississippi floods back in the 1930s. So and it's a short one, so I'm going to show you Jenny Cash to cool down and relax. <laughs> uh, oh, I have the water. Do we have the time? Two minutes? To, uh, Two minutes, yeah. Uh, Johnny Cash. It isn't, <laughs> it's a lot of feeling, but, you know. Thank you, Brad. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's not going to be under Just the one. Any, I'm Lulu. I actually am from the Philippines. And um, I'm now currently taking masters in University of Newcastle. Thank you for the presentation. Maybe uh, one of the things I wanted to share, an experience I had in Japan, I facilitated a group and our topic was on minority and inclusiveness. And one of the Japanese youth said, and which struck me most and made me really wonder, on, because I thought all the while I had this hardcore, um, definition of what minority and inclusiveness means. She said at some point we are we find ourselves as many minority. 
Um, there is minority in all of us, and in every group that we, for example, like religion. If I go to Indonesia, if I, if my religion is a majority in the Philippines, if I go to Indonesia, I feel minority or not having religion at all, yeah. or maybe like there's like different aspects in our lives that makes us feel minority at some point, and I feel like we have to all be mindful about it. And the idea of inclusiveness, that not putting everybody in one box, like this is one box, I want us all to fit in, but it's like there are different sizes of box, get into where you feel you would fit in. And, um, and I think because of my work for the past five years is in humanitarian, in humanitarian emergencies, and this is always a struggle, how to, be very sensitive of the different sensitivities on the ground. And even earlier, when we were talking about media, there's just so many things running on my head, and um, I can't help but recall those five years in the field where seeing different people with different needs. But, but maybe I just wanted to highlight the quote of one of your students, which you showed earlier, and it's very true. At the recovery or development phase where we wanted to introduce the rights of women based on Philippine laws, so we gather them. And we thought we have empowered them. You know, we say, oh, these are your rights, so you talk this out with your husband. And husbands become very defensive. And sometimes by sensitizing them of their rights, that became like a venue for their husbands to beat them. The husbands felt like it's an ego-bruising thing to realize that all these years, what they're doing with their wives are against the law. So we realized, okay, let's try to change the mechanism. Let's try to engage the men, because after all, they are our partners. So I just wanted to affirm that quote based on our experience in the field, that if we wanted to, to bring solutions to these um, issues, then we have to bring all the actors involved. And we don't create like this polarity that you are the villain and these are, you know, the victims. That's all. Thank you. Jason. I read it. Thanks so much for that. That's picking up on my point too. Um, when you were writing the LGBTI and Emergency Management Report with Dale and Liam, um, we came right up, right against this, you know, the, the contrast between that normative discrimination of men against women against all the other kinds of, of diversity that there is. And I think it can be seen as quite dated, that binary of men and women. But the fact is that we do live in a patriarchal society and you can see that in things like the pay gap, you know, violence against women, discrimination against women in pregnancy, objectification of women's bodies. Um, and my thesis this afternoon is that 40% of, of people who die in bushfires in Australia are, are female, they're, they're women and they're girls. And I think it's exactly because of that um, that hierarchy of men over women, but it's so normalised that none of us see it. Um, so I think it actually risks lives. So my question to you is, how can we bring that back into the discussion? I mean, it, it, it's difficult. I mean, because there are, there are two levels, but there's the practical level and the policy level. Um, I mean, the, the, the policy level, if we look at um, how gender has been included into some of the policies, um, it's often from the perspective of this binary. If you look, for example, at the, uh, the sphere humanitarian standards, then you have X number of uh, portaloos you need for X number of men, X number of women. If you don't fit the binary, then you don't get uh, I mean, you, you fall between the cracks. And it's even worse for the gender minorities that don't identify within uh, the, bi the binary and within the, uh, the LGBTIQ kind of uh, affiliation as well. Because it's something totally different, swapping, you know, swinging between male and female identities. 
which is what the Fafa filet of the Parla Warrior do sometimes. Um, so it's, it's, it's very tricky. I mean, it's about um, lobbying, I guess. Uh, but as Maureen was saying yesterday, we need evidence, and we need more evidence than uh, patchy kind of uh, research we have at the moment. And, and uh, I, don't have, I don't have a final answer, I don't have an actual answer to that kind of question. But it's about, it's about lobbying, I guess, from, uh, from the inside. Folks, time is against us. I'm sorry we can't get to your questions. Once again, please thank JC. Thanks, JC.